us this evening. Now, before we begin, I'd like to recognise that we're all joining from different parts of the country, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the Indigenous nations on whose land we collectively meet. In particular, for those of us from Yarra, we acknowledge the sovereignty of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people and note that this land was never ceded. Why can pay our respects to any Indigenous people joining us today and to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to recognise the strong connection of these traditional owners with the land and emphasise the lessons we can take from their traditional practices in confronting our present climate crisis. And I'll just turn off my phone. <laughs> Uh, WICAN is an independent community based a group based in the city of Yarra that exists to inspire urgent action in response to the climate emergency. One of our key aims is to foster awareness and build skills within the, commu uh, within the community. And this is where the webinar comes in. We appreciate you taking some time out on a weeknight to broaden your knowledge in a really meaningful way. This is the sixth event this year in WICAN's Climate Solutions webinar series. Generally, these are held on the third Wednesday of the month, and this one was just delayed because of the council um, caretaker mode period. And we have one more event for this year, which will be next month. I'll let Shane give you some more information about this at the end of the event. Now, I'll briefly explain how this session will run. To ensure things run as smoothly as possible, we'll pop everyone on mute. So if you have a question, please share it using the chat function. And we'll pause at several points during the presentation to field those questions. Do note as well that this session will be recorded and uploaded to our website so that we can share it as widely as possible. So with that, I'll hand over to Shane who will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. Um, we're really delighted tonight to have Sophie Green to talk to us about all things waste-wise in the city of Yarra. Uh, Sophie is currently the team leader of waste minimization for the council. Sophie's role at Yarra has seen her work on a range of behavior change programs in the waste minimization area, including in relation to electronic waste and single-use plastic. In the latter context, Sophie helps spearhead Yarra's successful, proudly plastic-free Yarra program which work with food traders to reduce their use of single-use plastic. I know that waste is a topic that many of you joining us tonight will feel really strongly about. And I know that it's particularly topical right now with the rollout of the purple glass-only recycling bin to households across the municipality, as well as changes to what is collected in our yellow bins. So we really do look forward to lots of questions for everyone. Sophie has informed me that the presentation structure is such that she'll stop around about two thirds of the way through for, for Q&A. So again, just to reiterate Andy's point, just please pop any questions that you have in the chat and we'll go through those um, when, when, we, when Sophie takes a break. And so without further delay, I'll hand over to you, Sophie. Thanks a lot. Thanks Shane, thanks Andy, and thank you YCAN for having me tonight. I'm really excited to be here talking about one of my favourite topics, waste and recycling, um, and what Yarra is doing to hopefully manage it better. Um, okay, why is it? Yeah, okay. Um, I really appreciate that amazing uh, acknowledgement of country that Andy provided, um, but also would like to um, to acknowledge in my own speech, the traditional custodians um, of the land on which I'm meeting tonight, the Wurundjeri and Wurrung people. And I think um, as pointed out, it's particularly pertinent when having discussions around resource use um, and uh, looking after our land that we acknowledge that the traditional owners where the land was never ceded probably did a much better job at, at this than um, we are currently doing. So a lot to be learned from that. All right, um, so waste and recycling at Yarra. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, so I started at Yarra about 18 months ago and I was, I'm was i new to the local council um, industry and, so, and new to waste and recycling. So like most of you in the room tonight, uh, I thought I was being a pretty good little greenie by diligently cleaning and sorting my waste and putting it in the yellow recycling bin. Um, and since working in the waste industry, I've been on quite the journey to discover the reality 
of Australia's waste and recycling industry, which currently faces uh, several systemic challenges. Uh, some of these include um, an over-reliance on international export markets, which has really led to very um, limited domestic processing and recycling infrastructure and, and the capacity to process and recycle um, onshore. And also um, a lack of consistent, transparent and accessible waste information and education for the community, which I'm sure you've all probably been quite frustrated with. Um, I'm very passionate about the last one um, around waste education. And that's what I do because without it, how are people who care um, about these issues meant to do the right thing. So um, I'm on a mission to improve the way we talk and communicate about waste, um, and hence why I'm here tonight. But um, despite sort of the turbulent nature of the industry um, in Australia, the good news is that Victoria has a pretty kick-ass plan uh, in the Recycling Victoria policy to transform the industry, um, increase the efficiency in the way we collect, sort, process and reuse materials and resources, um, and most significantly reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the waste sector, which currently make up about 10% of uh, Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. So one of the flagship programs um, from the state government policy, which was released earlier on in the year, uh, was the curbside reform program, which is really about changing the way we collect waste from the household um, including the introduction of a container deposit scheme, which many of people are very excited about coming into effect in 2023. And also um, a new curbside collection service where we'll be transitioning from a two bin model, which we've been used to for quite some time, to a four bin model. And really what this program is about is um, looking at standardizing um, the bin colors and what goes in each bin across different municipalities. So you move from council to council, you've got the same colour bin. That is a big thing in waste education. Um, the second thing, it's about aligning the system to local market development. Um, so what we're actually putting in the bin has a local end market that can be recycled. And then launching a huge community education program uh, to support this transition. So that's happening at a state level um, and also at a local level. And if people are interested to learn more about that, just ask me, because I, I, I've got, I know what Sustainability Victoria are doing there. Um, so to give you a sense of scale, just around municipal solid waste, it currently represents about 20% of waste generated in Victoria. So there's different, um, I suppose, industries that create waste. You've got your commercial, um, commercial waste, uh, construction waste, and then, yeah, your municipal solid waste representing 20%. Uh, but unlike those other streams, the recovery rate um, from household waste is, is a fair bit lower, with only 64% of household waste being sent, uh, sorry, with 64% with of household waste being sent to landfill. So we've got a big, um, a big way to go in terms of reducing our um, diversion from landfill there. So the takeaway from this is that um, household waste has a big part to play in fixing the system. And that's why tonight I'm here to talk about Yara's vision for revolutionizing the way we recycle um, and talk about the new curbside service that we're that is currently rolling out across the municipality. So what is changing? Um, look, most of you probably are aware of this, um, but Basically, we're rolling out a third bin. It's a glass bin. So from the 23rd of November, we are asking everyone to separate out their glass and put it in their glass bin. Um, we're making some significant changes to what goes in the yellow bin, which I will talk about in a lot more detail later. And then we're also asking people to um, change uh, when they're putting out those bins. So we're going to a fortnightly glass and fortnightly recycling. Um, now we're calling this the recycling revolution. And I know probably some of the skeptics in the room or we've had a lot of community feedback about why is this revolutionary? Like it's only an extra bin. We actually used to do this about 20 years ago. It's really not that big a change. Well, uh, there's a couple of things I'd say to that. We're really having to go back to basics with recycling. Um, we're aiming to deliver a model that is based on transparency uh, and is reflective and responsive to the reality of the Australian uh, recycling industry. So it's focused on material quality, 
cleaning up the state of our commingled recycling bin and glass and making sure that what we're actually collecting is fit for purpose for a local market. So Australia, uh, Yara's new uh, recycling processor, APR, um, Australia Paper Recovery, and I'll talk about them a bit later on as well, only accepts materials that has local end markets. So they're working with manufacturers onshore to ensure that what we're taking gets processed and recycled here and sold back onto the market. And that is probably what is revolutionary about this because there are very few recycling processes that have will say that they're that they're keeping things on shore, um, and therefore we're having to change what goes in that bin. So this means that yes, a lot of products that we used to collect um, will no longer be going in the yellow bin, and we also have a very strong focus on high value glass. Um, so the hand on heart we can say is genuinely being recycled here. And to support all this, um, we're having to re-educate the community about recycling. As I've said, our goal is about clean, high quality material. And we know that adjusting to some of the changes about what goes in the bin is gonna be challenging for many. And they're not, and some people will be starting this journey from the very, very beginning. Uh, but we are committed to supporting the community in this um, and making sure that um, we are giving them feedback through a much stronger focus on contamination management. For a long time, the industry has been pretty slack on contamination um, and we've just let a lot of what we call just recycling soup go in that bin. Well, we, we don't have that option anymore. So we're gonna be really uh, intentional around how we manage contamination and the feedback mechanisms we're providing to the community. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so yes, why not the food and green waste bin. Um, we are still planning on introducing this fourth bin um, and are committed to doing that in 2021. We don't have a date yet. I mean, this is, this is not just Yarra that's committed to that. It is now state government policy. So every council in Victoria will have to, in some way, shape or form, introduce a four bins, whether or not it's a curbside service or community drop-offs, but we will be doing a curbside service. Um, and the reason why we've chosen uh, glass before going FOGO, it really has to do with um, the lack of available international and domestic markets for recyclable material, which has put a significant strain on the industry. So we had intended rolling out a four bin this year. COVID put some serious, um, has put some serious spanners in the works around our operational budget. And because the federal government is bringing in export bans um, around unprocessed waste with glass being one of the first products that we will no longer be able to export um, in an unprocessed form, it really is a priority for the industry to clean up the glass stream and the commingled. Um, so by separating out glass, we can improve the quality of the material uh, of the glass itself, as well as actually improving the, the um, other mixed recycling materials, your paper, cardboard, plastics, and aluminium, and making them more suitable to, to local markets when we know those international markets are closing up. Uh, so that's, that's sort of why we've decided to prioritize glass. Um, I, a lot, many of you would have heard about uh, Yara's four bin waste trial um, that's been running for over 12 months now. And this, I mean, rolling out of our trial, um, of the service, sorry, really builds on the work we've done. We surveyed community, um, we trialled an education approach. We got a lot of feedback about the types of bins, the different size bins, the frequency. So a lot of the lessons from that program have fed into the design and delivery of this service. Um, the primary purpose of that model of the, of the trial was twofold. As I said, it was really to test a model for sorting and collecting waste uh, from the household, um, which is a critical aspect of fixing um, Australia's, uh, sorry, Victoria's recycling system. And the data, the actual program was, was funded by uh, the state government. And a lot of the evaluation findings and the data fed into the development of that, of that um, the Recycling Victoria policy. Um, so it was been a high profile project for sure. The other focus um, of the trial was really about material quality and contamination management. So trying to provide clean and consistent glass um, that's fit for market, as well as a better commingled recycling um, product. So the other recyclables 
that are ready for local markets as well. And the results um, from the trial were pretty good. Um, we had a total diversion of waste from landfill um, in the trial area at 61%, which is up from 35% prior to the trial. And this is actually more than um, other Metro Council, Metro Melbourne um, councils, even when they've got food and organic services. So a lot of the diversion came from introducing a food and green bin, but we also saw diversion because of the change of frequency and the improvement in the quality of the recycling material not being sent to landfill. Um, we've got a really pretty solid contamination rate for a food and green bin at about 3%, but we can probably make some, some wins on that. Um, and the quality of the glass has been one of the major things. So we've got about 98% um, of the glass is being recovered for glass bottles and jars, which is very, very good. And then, of course, the co-mingled recycling, a yellow bin, we still have um, persistent <laughs> contamination. But, um, and we know that's going to be a long-term challenge as it will be with the rest of the service, but we have made a lot of gains in terms of um, collecting material that stays onshore and therefore not sending overseas and with a much larger carbon footprint. So um, free bins, this is what we're all getting. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through each bin about why we're accepting those things. And then I'm going to give you some more information about where that material is going and what happens to it. And then I might pause with some questions. So glass. Um, yes. By, so yeah, by collect, separating glass, we can really improve both the quality of the glass and the quality of other materials because glass breaks at every part of the collection process. It breaks in the bin, it breaks once it's put in the truck, it gets put in the truck and squished, it then gets uh, crushed again once it gets to the material recovery facility. And then it actually shatters into all the plastics and the paper, making them a lot harder to separate and recycle. So by separating glass, we can make it a lot, um, a lot easier to actually separate for new glass products. Um, the thing about glass is that it actually melts at different temperatures. So not all glass can be recycled um, and not, and so therefore we're not accepting all glass in our purple bin. Um, we'll only be accepting glass bottles and jars. So as you'll see in the poster here, we're talking about um, beer bottles, wine bottles, condiment jars, pasta sauces, olive oil bottles, um, spirit bottles, and the back glass actually can be broken. If, if you've got a broken bottle, uh, broken beer bottle, you can put it in. The main thing is that the lid is off and that the glass, oh, sorry, that the glass is clean and has no food residue in it. Um, now we often, oh, I'll just talk through what we're not accepting. So yeah, we don't want the lids. Um, we don't accept drinking glasses, crystal glassware, uh, window glasses, eyeglasses. Uh, broken crockery, bakeware, Pyrex, and then, as I said, glass with food and resin dew. So um, we often get asked about paper labels, um, and I thought I would address this because it's, it's a good question. I mean, we will accept glass with paper labels on it, um, but if you want to be an amazing recycler, it would be great if you could take them off. <laughs> um, and that's sort of the best practice. What happens is the glass goes to the processing facility, it gets crushed and then it'll get put through a sieve where little pieces of paper or foreign objects will, will get separated from the glass. But um, of course, think not everything will get caught in that sieve. So the more stuff that's in there that's a foreign, not pure glass, the lower the quality of the material and that's how we define contamination. Glass is a material that can be processed infinitely um, and used when uh, recycled, it can be used to make other glass products and actually overall reduce um, you know, the energy and use of other raw materials. So there's a big demand for recycled glass and it's made from virgin sand, which is a, a finite and very expensive material. Um, initially, the glass from Yara's bins will be going to a company called Alex Fraser, where it will be cleaned, crushed and cleaned and then eventually be used to replace virgin sand for road surfacing and construction. 
Now, um, whilst you know, it's, a, it's a good end use for the glass, ideally we would really like to get to glass to glass manufacturing because this would maximize the value chain of the glass itself and reduce resource loss. Um, but to do this, we do need to be able to provide a consistent, clean stream of the product. So our priority at the moment is really about separating it out, getting it really clean, improving the robustness of that stream until we're much more confident that um, that glass is a, is a high quality product that can go into glass to glass down the road. I will also say just around um, glass, the market for glass and glass sorting is it is still quite limited because as I've noted, we are going, the industry is going through a process of, of transformation uh, here in Australia. Uh, one of the main glass manufacturing companies, OI, uh, Owen, I can't remember the last acronym, but was uh, just recently sold to Visi, which is one of the big recycling processes. Uh, and the transition uh, to this new facility will take some time. The other thing is that um, there's new glass beneficiation technology that's needed to come on board in um, Australia with technology like optical sorting machines that are able to identify the different quality and colour of glass through uh, yeah, an optical sorting process. And then uh, the better we can sort that material, the better we can get remove the best uh, quality glass or that glass to glass manufacturing. So we're, we're waiting for some of this infrastructure um, to come on board. Um, and I think we'll see quite a lot of change in the local glass industry in the next five to 10 years, especially once more councils roll out glass bins. So one of the most important changes um, of the new service is actually what we put in the changes to the recycling, to the yellow recycling bin. Our new recycling processor, as I talked about APR, is now only accepting items that can be recycled in Australia, which is aimed at helping growing the local industry and ensuring that what we, um, ensuring a local recycling market and that things stay on shore and reduce our overall carbon footprint. Uh, this means that some things that we used to put in the bin, like milk and juice cartons, this includes your um, long life milks, your non-lactose milks that come in a product called Tetra Pak, um, uh, including aerosol cans, bottle lids, and a lot of plastics are actually no longer going to be accepted in the yellow bin. And this is going to be a big, big change for the community. So we're saying yes to higher grade plastics, that is plastic bottles that have a label with a number one and a number two, and plastic food containers that have a um, that have a plastic label number five. So that's like your your butters, margarines, meat trays, uh, dip containers. There's quite a few materials that have plastic number five, um, and the other materials will still be accepting a paper and cardboard. Uh, steel cans, tins, aluminium cans, aluminium foil and metal lids. But importantly, we won't be taking glass. Um, as I said, the food and drink cartons like milk and juice cartons that are made of that composite material, aerosol cans, lids and a lot of other plastics, including all the things that we never accepted that people still put in there. Coffee cups, plastic bags, soft plastics. I mean, you name the product, it's gone in the recycling bin. It's a mess in there. Um, so yeah, that's the changes to the recycling bin. I suppose just to delve down a little bit more into plastics, plastics is a bit of a minefield and I can talk about this a little bit um, later, but I think it's really important to understand that the numbers and symbols found on the bottom of plastic items are not actually recycling symbols, despite them sort of looking like recycling symbols. Uh, they're actually plastic identification codes, which tell you what type of plastic it's made from. So there's about seven or so different plastic resins, and this is how they identify it. Different recycling processes in Australia accept different types of plastics based on the end markets that they've got available to them. And as I've talked through, we are going to be accepting very different plastics to a lot of other councils. Um, the fact of the matter is that <laughs> local end markets for plastic recycling are very, very limited. And we are gonna be, it's gonna be a while before a lot of these new markets um, open up. 
you know, we're looking at a system where crude oil is at record low prices um, and often recycling plastic is a lot more expensive than, sorry, than new plastic is a lot more, is a lot cheaper than recycling plastic. And so the market itself for plastics in a way has, has failed uh, recycling as an outcome. It's not to say that market interventions uh, like taxes and government mandated by recycle targets and further regulation won't change the plastic market. And we are seeing, we will see that happen. Um, I mean, other big packing, packaging manufacturers like Pepsi and Coke now have, you know, public commitments to plastic recycled content. So that will change, but it's going to take some time. So um, as I talked about, we are taking a, a very few number of plastics. I just thought I would quickly tell you where these plastics are gonna end up. Um, so our plastic code one, which is a PET, and these are bottle, usually the bottles that we're accepting will be made into new plastic bottles. Plastic two, um, which is made of a product called HDPE bottles, they'll be made into plastic bollards, pallets, um, fencing, barrier railings, and deck boards. There's also plastic two HGPE laundry bottles. So laundry bottles and, and like shampoo bottles, um, a lot of those are, are made of plastic two. They're gonna get made into new bottles. Um, so the best, the highest quality plastics are your number one and your number two. Then uh, your plastic code five, um, which is made of a product called polypropylene resin, they'll be made into new food grade containers um, and, and casings around electric cabling. So yeah, as I said, plastics is a complex and challenging space for the industry. And I don't think pack packaging labeling does much to help, if I'm honest. Um, many plastic products are made of composite materials. So they might have one or two plastics in them, which makes it even harder to recycle because usually you need a single stream. And then the other issue we've got from an education perspective is that um, asking, telling people just to put in like plastic punnets doesn't solve the issue if one manufacturer uses one type of plastic for their punnet and the other manufacturer uses a different type of plastic. So we've gone with the coding system to um, identify what goes in and out of that bin. Um, now, I think what I'll do is I'll just play this video and then, because it's all about what I just talked about, and then I'll stop for questions. Um, Another council that has rolled out um, uh, a four-band system and is using the same recycling process is Hobson's Bay. And they've done this video um, with the recycling process at APR to uh, show you what happens at the facility. So I thought I would share it. It goes for about four minutes and then I'll pause for questions. Oops, sorry. Sophie, um, we're oh. struggling with the sound a little bit, actually, to be honest. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't really know if I can turn it. It won't go any louder on. Oh. Can you not hear it all? Uh, it's not clear. And it, it's also freezing. Is it? Okay. Um, okay, maybe if I just give me a second. It's a shame because it is good. Let me see if I play it directly from YouTube, if that makes a difference. Uh, uh, uh. 
Is that any better? No. No. Oh, well, that's a shame. I don't really know if there's a technical fix for that, unfortunately. Um, what I can do is send it round. Um, Shane, when you do a follow-up, I can provide the link and maybe you can send it round in the, in the email. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Unless, unless no, that's, that's something fine. to do with my Zoom, I don't know whether it's anything to do with the, the fact we're recording as well or I, I don't know, unless anyone's uh, got any suggestions. Yeah, I'm not sure. But well, maybe we'll just um, stop for questions now. And then, yep. um, yeah, so as soon as a few pop up in the chat, and then we can keep going. Sure. So, I mean, maybe we'll throw, Jesse, you've got a couple of questions. Maybe we'll throw to you. We'd like to ask uh, Sophie your questions. Maybe, Jesse, maybe your mute, Sarah, if, is, yeah. Could you please unmute Asking her to unmute? Hello. Yes. I can yeah. Hear. Great. I did have a few questions. I know that um, you've covered a few things, like you said, the uh, Tetra Packs can no longer go to be recycled mm -hmm. um, by Yarra. So are we now sending those to landfill? Yes. Um, I can talk to Tetra Packs. So <clears throat> there is not a single processing piece of technology in Australia that processes Tetra Pak. I've had this confirmed on multiple occasions um, by different people across the industry. What's been happening with Tetra Packs is it's been going in the mixed load, um, sorted at the facility and then sent overseas. And then there's different standards um, and technology overseas for processing Tetra Packs. So I can tell you in terms of keeping things on shore, um, other councils that are accepting Tetra Packs, they're not staying on shore unless they're being sent to landfill. Um, we'd prefer to be, I suppose, transparent about that and say that until such time when there is that technology here, we're not going to be telling people it goes in the recycling bin. Um, I've The long-term play on Tetra Packs that I've heard is that um, they can melt it because the thing is it's a composite material it's made of cardboard plastic and aluminium foil so separating out those materials is very uh energy and water intensive um so the process that they're looking into is actually about melting it and turning it into plasterboard for construction okay. but quite a long way off that that stuff being ready in australia okay but other councils are still accepting that yes they are yeah um, now, you mentioned before about glass jars, if they had paper labels, they're okay to recycle. What about if they've got plastic labels? Mm. I mean, it's the same It's the same issue. Like, if you, if you can take them off, it's great. It will interfere with the, um, you know, the, the crushing process and it might bring down the quality. But, I mean, we will accept them. Um, yeah, and same with... Um, the you know in a wine bottle how you've got uh that metal cap at the top that sits below you know the twist off um so what happens at the at the glass sorting facility is that they they have a magnet that pulls off metal from um the glass so those products what happens is they'll it'll suck towards the magnet and then swipe off the any part of the bottle that's got that metal so the glass that's in there actually gets lost. So if you do want to be a, a really legendary recycler, you can try to pull those glass, those metal things off. But yeah, not practical. For okay. some um, so in regards to the plastic labels, some mm. of them peel off really easily and others are almost impossible to remove. Mm. So would that be more just emailing the manufacturer directly and saying, hey, could you change the glue that, you know, you adhese your labels with? Yeah, or tell them that they need to not use a plastic label at all. Like, yeah, yeah. packaging, yeah. The packaging 
industry has a lot to answer in terms of this. Like one plastic bottle, like your Schweppes bottle, has three different types of material on it. It's got a plastic lid that's made from one plastic, the plastic base, which is another plastic, and then the paper. Now, why are we making products that have three different types of materials on them? We should be trying to move towards single stream. So yeah, putting the pressure on packaging manufacturers to try to clean up um, the materials that they're putting out into the system is a big part of this whole problem. Mm. Um, and on to composting. So Yara won't be getting um, compost bins individually until you said 2021, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yeah. Uh, are there any community composting sites that uh, you can drop off your food scraps to at the moment? Yeah, there are. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to find those. So Yara has a resource on the website called the Zero Waste Map. Um, and if you go to the food waste category, it's basically an online directory of places that of like recycling, reuse, reduce um, initiatives across the municipality. If you go to the food waste category, there should be a community drop off um, like function and you can see where you can drop them off. Um, the other place you can look at is share waste. Although I think because of COVID, a lot of places have been um, uh, not taking community compost from residents. Um, and we're also, Yara's looking into a trial at the moment for uh, food and green, or yeah, food and garden waste drop off at the depot, but we're just working through some of that proposal at the moment. Mm. Did you, okay, no hi, Jesse, did you see my message in the chat? I, I work at the Carlton Neighbourhood Learning Centre and there's a compost hub there. Okay, no worries. I'm Richmond, so I was hoping for something a little closer. Okay. I think this solved. one at the um, uh, the, the other neighbourhood house in um, in Richmond. Sorry, I, the okay. name. Is I'll, I'll check on the uh, the zero waste map and see if it's yeah. on there. But yeah. thank you for that. Centre. Um, and so the last question that. Um, the little plastic lids that come like on the Tetra packs and other items, so they can't be recycled? No, in the rubbish bin. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, just a, if there's a kindergarten in Richmond, isn't there, where they have a compost bin too? I forget the name of it, a childcare centre. Sophie, I don't know. Um, mm. Yeah, most of the neighbourhood houses mm. uh, have collections I don't remember off the top of my head I have to say but um if it's available it should be on the zero waste map but I, I will double check that um they've been doing it for quite a long time but I can't remember mm -hmm. its name yep yeah I think it's on Kent Street maybe um anyway yeah could be <laughs> thanks Jesse that, that's that's some great questions um Moving right along, um, Janet had a, had one quick had one question there earlier earlier on in the chat. Janet, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I was a bit curious about what sort of contamination was um, particularly noticeable in the yellow bins in in this site. Mm. Um, as in in the like, what's what. What is contamination and the different types that we get? Is that what the question is? Um, yes. Um, well, I suppose I'm interested in what it is now out of all our yellow leaded bins, but particularly yep. in the Abbott test area. Yeah, yeah, okay. Look, um, there is so many different types of contamination. <laughs> so um, basically, yeah, there's three different types of contamination. This is what I was going to talk about on the next slide. It's when things are, items are dirty and haven't been emptied. So we would consider that contamination. Um, you know, a lot of food residue, especially on plastic and cardboard. Um, when non-recyclable items um, are put in the recycling bin or the non, non-glass items in the glass bin. And then was when recycling is in a plastic bag, that creates a lot of issues as well. Um, and then you've just got a myriad of things that people put in, like we get clothing, electronic waste, garden waste, household waste. People think that just because it could be recycled, it can go in the curbside bin. 
So in terms of what we've seen in the trial area, um, our contamination approach was really targeted at improving the quality of glass. So we went really hard on the glass bin. And as I said, showed you before, the results are pretty good. We've only had about 3% contamination and it's mainly lids on. We need lids off those jars. That's the main thing for the glass. For the, for the yellow bin, um, well, we're still seeing bag recycling, soft plastics, but the main thing we're, we're seeing also is, yeah, the, the wrong type of plastic because we're very specific about the type of plastic. And then we're still seeing coffee cups um, and then, yeah, Tetra packs, as I talked about before, they'd be the main things. Um, so we're going to have to refocus our contamination management approach in, um, in the trial area as well as more broadly as part, across the council. I mean, just to talk through why contamination is an issue, because we're, we're talking about it. I mean, essentially sending things to the facility that simply aren't recyclable means that sorters have to try and pick out the wrong things. And this is usually done by hand. And, um, and those things get put in a pile and then taken to a landfill. So by putting things to the wrong facility, we have to, uh, we extend, and then having to send a landfill, we, in, the cost, the carbon cost of that transport and the cost to council, but then having to divert it to the landfill, it costs us a lot more. So that's a big issue. Um, the other issue is that bag recyclables, so when people put their, um, yeah, their items in bags, and this happens a lot in multi-unit developments because people put all their recyclables in a bag and take it down to a communal bin. Now, what happens is um, they'll just get picked off the line in these bags and then all the materials in there that could have been recycled on the line, separated, they will just get lost. They'll get put in the landfill pile and get taken to a landfill. Um, the other issue, just going back to the lids, um, as I talked about, is that it sort of interferes with the sorting process. Soft plastics get caught in the machinery because they use these sieves. So, yeah, soft plastics are really bad. And then the wrong types of plastic um, are just very hard to identify. So they'll often get put in the wrong stream and then it basically lowers the quality of the material. So that's sort of the issue of contamination. Um, yeah, and really, really bad contamination where we're talking 30% or more of a bin and more 30% of a load. Um, they won't even bother sorting it. They'll take it straight to the landfill because they're like, this has got no value to us. It's too much money and energy for us to sort through this stuff. Fantastic. There's a lot of, a lot of questions coming through, which is, which is awesome. Um, so... We had a question from just Lisa. Uh, Lisa, do you want to ask your question, Sophie? Lisa, you might need to unmute. I'm not sure if you're. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, just having a tech issue for a second. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm changing rooms as well, and then I just kicked the cat accidentally. It's just been a disaster. <laughs> um, um, I was just wondering, um, I think you kind of answered my question before. It was around, well, who's responsible then for the changes to, you know, plastic types and um, how do we get these more narrowed down to a smaller range so it's more straightforward so there's not errors made by the processing, by the companies who make food or goods or whatever. Mm. How does that happen? And, you know, how do, do we do help as consumers to push the, the issue, you yeah. know? Yeah, look, I think this is a really critical part to this whole problem is we, we, we're, in this, we're in the business of managing the downstream end of waste, right? So, like, we get given whatever's there and we're going to try to figure out what to do with it and try to make the best value out of it. But where there's huge gains to be made is controlling what comes in upstream. So at the moment we have, I mean, there, there is something like, like just tens of thousands of different types of plastics out there. Things are not um, labeled consistently. Um, things have recycling symbols on them that don't actually relate to what is genuinely recyclable. I mean, everything is technically recyclable. That doesn't mean we have a process to recycle it. So um, contacting uh, your, yeah, your big packaging manufacturers, 
um, to ask them to think about what their, their products are, to make sure they're talking to industry like recycling processes to understand what the challenges are in terms of sorting and processing it is definitely um, something that I would encourage everyone in the community to do. We will probably do some, um, ad, well, like Yara as a council advocates about packaging reform and packaging labeling to all the avenues that we can, but it is a really a consumer driven movement so refusing packaging that you know is not recyclable, you know, single-use plastics, and then um, trying to avoid as much packaging as possible in the supermarket is another big action that people can take. We've got a long way to go on plastics. Um, there, is, there is, you know, the government is trying to incentivize better packaging um, labeling and better packaging use. Um, and they're putting in mandates around recycled, like having actually having to put recycled content in your packaging to try to create that local market as well. So there is there is stuff to there is stuff happening in this area, but we're definitely a long way off it being a perfect system. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, Ty. Um, Lily had a had a question. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for tonight. It's really interesting. I was so excited when I opened my front door this morning, my new glass bin was there. It was yeah, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just curious, I think poor Philip did this um, thing with the glass bin where they put it in a communal spot and yeah. so instead of everyone getting individual glass bins, like everyone was just dropping it off to that communal bin. Because um, yeah. I really like, I mean, Fitzroy and then there's the library and then you've got, um, the e-waste bin there and clothing drop-off bins there and I thought wouldn't it be good to have the glass bin there so just wondering what that decision making process was and then secondly when the CDS comes into effect like what's the trajectory of, like how would that affect our individual household glass bins thank mm -hmm. you yep um, in terms of the decision around curbside versus communal recycling um, I mean it from what I've heard, we might look we might look into community drop-offs for glass later on down the track. But at the end of the day, we need to get glass out of the curbside recycling bin. Um, so, and the recycling and all the data shows that if you give someone a bin at source, they're going to be much more responsible with how they separate out their different waste streams. So the priority for us was really about getting that glass out of that stream at the curbside, making it really convenient for most people. Um, now we appreciate that not everyone has space for those bins and also don't produce a lot of glass. So, I mean, you know, there is an option to not have that bin and we will have a glass drop off at the depot. Um, I suppose, yeah, the priority has de definitely been the curbside, but not to say that later on down the track, we might do um, community drop offs as well. Um, in terms of the, uh, the second part, which was, oh, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> It was just about how the CDS will impact the, CDS. the glass bin. Yeah. So my understanding is the CDS, they're not going to be collecting glass. It was announced that it's going to be plastic, probably PET bottles, uh, maybe HDPE, um, so high-quality plastics and aluminium cans. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Different from the other states. Yeah, it might be that they um, it might be that they have glass. I'm not sure that that detail definitely hasn't come out yet. I know that the state government's still working on it, but yeah, at the end of the day, we know that the most effective way to improve um, the recyclability of materials is at the curbside. They're sort of like uh, additional ways um, to incentivize better recycling and sorting behaviors, like CDSs. But the curbside is where the real gains can be made. Mm. Well, thanks. I have a couple of questions, uh, Sophie, myself. Um, yep. Can you perhaps talk about, do you, why did Yarrow decide to go its own way in relation to um, this area rather than um, partner with some adjoining councils to do something collectively? What was the, what was the thinking around that? As in partner? Oh, just partner to, you know, to um, 
to do something consistent with what the surrounding councils are doing? Why, why did Yarra yeah. decide to do something? Why did Darabin decide to do something, something yeah. else and Moreland something different? What, what was the, is, is there any advantage in, mm. in councils working, you know, um, collectively on this issue or is, is, is it just, you know, everyone comes to their own decision about what they want to do for their particular, for their area? What, what's mm. the, what was the thinking? Yeah, it's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, well, the first thing I'd say is that we have a very engaged and progressive community that are pushing us on sustainability outcomes. Um, and, and with the recycling crisis being such a prominent issue, there's an expectation from the community that we need to be doing better. So mm -hmm. the first one, in terms of um, why we went our own way, I mean, there's a couple of reasons for that. Mainly the fact that we uh, were with, so our um, recycling processor at the time when the recycling crisis hit and we could no longer export um, materials overseas, we actually decided to change recycling processes because they had broken our contract and move to another one. Um, and that provided us with an opportunity to go, well, hang on a second, let's rethink this model. We know glass is an issue. If we're going to have to, if we're going to have to go back to a domestic um market and those markets the international markets have closed up and we've gotten out of this contract then we can actually reshape the way we're doing it and that provides us with an opportunity to think differently um mm. but so of, just sorry just 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 jumping in there so but why did why hasn't every council had every every council's got the same issue why mm. hasn't haven't other councils done similar thinking and come to similar conclusions as yara what, what, what's how do, you, how do you think about that? I mean, why, why is Yarra doing this, but then some other councillors faced with exactly the same issues deciding to do something completely different or, or something a little bit different anyway? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I have to be honest, I don't really know. I uh, can't speak for other councils. Um, this has been an issue that's been happening. I mean, why haven't they done it still? You know, like mm. the markets are closing up. China has said by, by early 2021, they're not going to be accepting any recyclable materials. So what, where, where are those councils sending that material? And those, mm. I don't know. <laughs> right. It's a very right. good question. Um, which I, yeah, I think yeah. In terms of working with other councils, I mean, we we do work with other councils. Hobson's Bay, um, as I said, have rolled out a similar model that was based on Yarra's. Um, we've shared all the learnings from our trial with other councils, um, and uh, I think Masses and Rangers has done the same. We have catch-ups with Hobson Bay to share lessons learned, to talk about challenges. Um, so we do we do collaborate, and mm -hmm. there is um, yeah, they there is some potential projects in the back uh, around yeah, some some lo more localized um, processing and stuff that Yara is talking to other councils about. But councils working together it takes time, I suppose. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so we've just kind of been on a mission to clean up our, our waste. Um, but yeah, we do we do collaborate where we can. I might just turn my light on, it's getting really dark in here. <sighs> when you were talking about, when you were talking about glass to glass recycling, mm. would, we, would we need to completely rethink the way we do collect the glass because you'll still get a lot of smashed glass even if you've got a glass only bin I assume that there's just a truck and it gets, gets tipped into the truck I assume that some amount of you know that that's that in that process glass is always going to get smashed yeah um would we need to like how do we handle it with kid gloves so that it actually doesn't get smashed in the process it's not that the glass is broken that's the issue so once it gets taken it's just the type of glass so when the glass into um, the beneficiation uh, sorting facility, it all gets crushed. That's like the first thing that happens. And then um, the better quality, and then it gets sorted into different glass streams. So as long as we can say that what's in that glass, high quality, clean glass, that will keep the value of the entire glass load up. Right, perfect, perfect. Should we, did you want me just to finish off the rest of the presentation and then just close out any questions at the end? That would be awesome. Yes, please. That'd be great. Okay, great. Um, so I've talked about contamination um, and yeah, I think 
It's a really important part to this whole model that we are going to be really proactively managing contamination. And how we're going to, we're going to do this in a couple of different ways. Um, firstly, we're really improving the way we collect our contamination data. So we are launching yeah, our curbside our crews, our collection crews are going to be doing visual inspections of all the bins and any identifiable contamination they can see, they will sticker that bin, mark the sticker with what the contamination is and actually leave it behind until, and then you'll have to remove the contamination item, call up council and then we'll come collect it. So that's one of the first things we're doing. We're then also going to be looking, getting much better data from our, um, our material recovery facility, our, the recycling processor, about what issues they're seeing at their end. Um, and then we're going to be feeding this information back to the community. Um, we're hoping that within sort of the first six months of the new service, we will have such good data that, you know, we might be able to do hit local hotspots. So one street that's really struggling on these particular items can let a box drop them. We can do door knocks. Um, we can invite them to a webinar to really hone in on that waste education aspect. Um, and then just to go to the point around multi-unit developments, um, we know multi-unit developments are going to be a big challenge for Yarra. Um, we service a lot of them. There's like 850 to 900 multi-unit developments. Um, and we have some of the largest in Melbourne. Um, and I believe, yes, we've got uh, some residents from Acacia Place here tonight who um, uh, would know about the, the contamination challenges at, at multi-unit developments. Um, we've done a lot of, we're doing some proactive outreach and engagement with property managers. Um, we've developed a whole new suite of collateral um, and toolkits on how to set up best practice waste management systems there. Um, we'll be doing face-to-face -face on the ground education sessions, um, going out of the facilities, checking that they've got, um, you know, the right mix of bins. We've got signage that we can stick up. Uh, we've got newsletter content. We've got a whole new suite of stuff that we can support to help support multi-unit developments. Um, it's definitely, there's no quick fix to it, but we are trying to gear up our work in that space um, because we know it's going to be a big issue. Um, I think I've already really covered that we're moving to fortnightly collections. Um, I think the final thing I really wanted to close out on is, yeah, yeah sort of that, we are very committed to working with the Yarra, com uh, Yarra community to provide options around the service. Um, we know that there's no one size fits all approach. There's lots of different housing types in, uh, in Yarra. And so not everyone's gonna want uh, a third bin. We've got different bin sizes. We've got bin sharing options. Um, and if you don't want a bin, um, you can opt out and we will. And there's also a community drop off at uh, the Clifton Hill Depot for people that barely produce waste, um, uh, glass waste, which is awesome if you do. Um, the other thing, as I talked about, is we've really ramped up um, our education and communications on this. So we would have loved to have done a lot more face-to-face -face events and done a bit of a community roadshow, gotten out to all schools, fates, libraries, whatever. Obviously, COVID's put a big um, spanner in the works there. Um, so we have designed the, a raft of tools to help support the community through these changes. Um, and we're in the final stages of updating all the information and content on the website, um, including we've done a new and improved A to Z guide. So this is a really comprehensive list of like all your household materials, um, whether it tells you what bin they go in and if they don't go in a curbside bin, where you can take them to be recycled or how you properly dispose of them. And that guide will be, the updated guide will be available just before the new, um, the first bin gets collected on the 23rd of November. We've got new toolkits for commercial businesses and for multi-unit development uh, residents and property managers. As I talked about, we've got this Yarra Zero Waste Map, uh, which is a directory of all your waste minimization needs. We've got new service collateral. We've got translated signage into eight different languages. We're going to do some um, more webinars later in November, one for property managers of multi-unit developments. And also we're going to do one um, probably targeted for like kids and families through the libraries. And we're also developing a short um, video animation series that will launch after November that really targets contamination um, and correct material acceptance um, in the yellow and purple bins. 
Um, and then finally, we've got uh, an option for people to subscribe to an SMS service where you can get um, weekly reminders about when to put your bin out, uh, which bin is going out and some reminders about what goes in the bin. So um, I suppose my call to action for everyone here is um, to become a recycling revolutionary. And to do this, it's, um, I'm asking people to update their recycling knowledge, um, getting right what you put in each bin, um, always taking the lids off uh, your products and making sure material is clean and dry, so managing your contamination. Check the numbers on plastics before you put them in the bin. Um, and I suppose be mindful about the types of packaging that you're buying. Try and minimise plastics as much as you can or only buy plastics that you know can be recycled in the uh, yellow bin, which is your plastics one and two and fives. And then buy recycled, uh, buy products that have recycled content in them. So this creates a local market and supports a local industry. Um, as an example, you know, reflex paper is made in Victoria and has a high percentage of recycled um, paper in it. And then share these tips with friends. Um, yeah, try to spread the word. The good, at the end of the day, the success of the new model really depends on every individual in Yarra uh, being more conscious about their waste and what they're buying and how they're disposing and sorting, sorting their waste. So it's up to all of us to get it right. Um, great, so any other questions? Yeah, so that, that's, that's awesome, Sophie. Um, uh, Andy had just, uh, just shot through a question. Andy, do you want to ask uh, the question you just put through? Yeah, uh, what I was saying is one of the things that I think leads to people being confused about recycling, because I think most people want to do the right thing, but they, they don't know because every different council area uh, has different requirements because they have different companies doing the collection. Mm -hmm. And how do we overcome this problem? Mm, yeah, it's a big challenge and a big gripe of mine when I came into the industry. Um, so in terms of the state government is, uh, as part of their reform, is launching uh, a new body it will be an amalgamation of some existing state government entities called the Waste Authority. And their role will be to legislate, um, well, yeah, to, and provide standards around curbside bins and curbside collections. So as I talked about, some of that will be standardising the colours and it will also be standardising what goes in each bin. So, for example, with Tetra Packs, we're not telling people that you can put Tetra Packs in your bin if there's no local end market and it can't be recycled on shore. So we're hoping that, that uh, the state government will take a lead on trying to provide some standards across the state for what's collected um, to, to try to minimise this issue because, as you've identified, it is a very big one around uh, confusion uh, in the community. Um, the other thing is that the, the um, state government will also be doing some, uh, we're launching huge new education and awareness campaigns around recycling. Um, Sustainability Victoria is currently in the process of developing those campaigns. Um, I'm sitting on the uh, working group for that. And so I'm feeding into it and I'm very strongly advocating that we need to be we need some consistency around the message. So if there's a question mark about whether or not we recycled, please don't put it in that campaign. We need to be telling people that you can only put things in there that we know have a local recycling market. So, I mean, it's a, hopefully some of these things create a bit of a race to the top around um, recycling education information that improves that consistency. Um, and yeah, otherwise there will be variations at a local council level that will always happen. Um, but yeah, I'm hopeful that there will be some improvements around that in the next few years. Great. And, uh, and Sarah had a, uh, had a question as well, I think it's quite relevant. Sarah, do you want to ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, Sophie. I uh, just interested in public housing. My understanding is that public housing buildings don't come into Yarra Waste Revolution. 
Mm. Um, so in the trial, public housing buildings, so it depends on the building. There's like tall buildings and short buildings. Understanding is that um, we are rolling the service to the lower density uh, public housing buildings, uh, but that the large multi-unit buildings, which are particularly um, difficult to work with because, I mean, yeah, contamination is very high, but we won't be rolling out to those large facilities. We may, it's, a re, it's essentially a real issue. We've been talking to DHHS about how we manage this. The expectation is around rolling out three to four bins to public housing. Um, and we still haven't sort of gotten clarity on that yet. Um, but eventually I think they will probably have to come on board, but it just might take more time. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, the people in those, pub, those um, buildings are members of Yarra. They're part of our community. And I think um, yeah, I, I absolutely understand that DHHS needs to be involved and assist council with resourcing. But I think it I think it's a really great um, tactic to to talk to DHHS because it's yeah it's a lot of people and a lot of um, education that's needed. Yeah absolutely. Yeah. And I and the other question I guess relates a little bit to that with the stickers. I mean you might have somebody who's got no idea what to do or how to read the sticker and their bin sits there unemptied like what is there a process around that for assisting people who may not understand yeah um yeah that's a that's a very good question so we have with all our service collateral tried to design it in a way that um is as accessible as possible so obviously people speak different languages but with the images and the uh, visual prompts around, you know, what, what is a contaminant and what's on this, and we've tried to um, make that as accessible as possible. And we've done a fair bit of user testing around those. But if a bin does get stickered and left and, the, and it doesn't get um, removed and it's left on the street, it will probably become an issue for local laws. Um, they do patrol the streets and then neighbors can also call up and, or write to council and let us know that it hasn't been attended to. So um, yeah, it's, it, there's definitely no easy fix on that. And we'll probably just have to work with um, residents and the community to, to try to work through that. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. So if you all had a question, what, what, what's Yarra itself doing in terms of creating in markets for recycled product? Mm, yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so, I mean, I think the, so with the, with the road base, for example, so um, we have like the, the, the glass from some of the trial has gone into road base that has been, um, we've used in local road upgrades. So that's one quick fix that we've been doing. Um, however, that's, yeah, that's just one small thing. In terms of buying recycled, um, Yarra doesn't really have a buy recycled policy yet um, or a circular economy policy. It is something that is in the works. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, from a procurement point of view, we do have a role to play in this. Um, and yeah, probably not quite there yet really with it, but it should be um, a priority of council. Yeah, and lobby, lobby your councillors to prioritise it. Perfect. Um, and I guess just, just um, what, when other councils have gone through this process, have, I assume there are other councils do have these uh, dedicated glass bins. I mean, what, I guess you've learnt from them, what is the main, main hurdles that need to be surmounted before, you know, to make this, to make this really successful? Mm, yeah. Um, so the main hurdles are probably around um, adoption and compliance. So people understanding uh, that source separation is the new way forward for waste management from a curbside. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. and think that they need to take responsibility for source separation and then compliance to the specific um, material acceptance that we have in each bin. I mean, glass is not going to be so much of an issue. We know from the trial that with some proactive communication, with good contamination management and bin stickering, um, we can get the glass stream looking pretty good um, within probably, you know, six months. Um, but the, we know that the recycling bin is going to take a lot longer and it's going to, yeah, it's going to be a long journey, especially because of how specific we're having to be around plastics. Um, we're utilising the same tools and tactics, um, but, yeah, it's going to be a longer journey. And then the other major uh, challenge for Yarra, as I've touched on, is definitely multi-unit developments. Um, they're known for having very high contamination I mean, the major issue is that, you know, there's no, in a lot of those buildings, it's very hard to um, create accountability for who's putting contamination in the bin. Um, we, we will, as I said, be working directly with property managers at multi-unit developments. And I believe even um, we'll be running a separate truck. They might have a separate collection day for some of them so that we can really focus in on um, like, the contamination data and understanding what is in that stream, what's causing the issues. So yeah, the multi-unit developments is going to be, it's a big beast, um, but our team, my team will be pivoting to work, uh, doing a lot of proactive engagement with them next year. Awesome. That, that's, that's great. Um, and just, just on that point, did, 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 and did you have a question about, did you have a, did you have a, You've obviously you're you're in an, you're in an MUD. What do you have any uh, questions you'd like to just? Uh, we were talking just briefly before the before the um, webinar started. Do you have any questions you'd like to throw to to Sophie while you have a chance? Uh, it's John here, and oh, John, yeah, and doing something else. Um, my question is about um, data for each of the multi-unit developments. I mean, we've got so much here, the truck comes in and he spends ages picking up. How, do you weigh each truck so you can then start getting a split between um, recyclables, waste? Mm. Um, where's that data come from? Because that, that would be something that could feed back to the residents. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, the contamination data gets measured at the material recovery facility. So it essentially the truck goes to the facility and gets weighed on a weight bridge. Um, and then that data is actually used to invoice council. So it is very it's accurate and important data because that's pretty much how much we pay. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, measuring the contamination in a load, it, that's going to be measured in a couple of different ways. Um, are we going to have to do a big baseline audit of our um, of the whole service, which will be like a sample size? We we'll probably do that once a year, but then we'll be doing weekly, regular um, sort of sample audits at the facility where uh, they sort of measure out. Yeah, they pick a sample of material and they say, right, thirty percent is contamination or twenty percent is contamination. These are the types of contaminated issues based on that sample. Um, and yeah, it's the contamination thing is a critical one because the more contaminated the load is, actually the more expensive it is for us to, it, it costs us all money. So there's yeah. a very strong business case around reducing contamination. Yeah, what I was getting at is not so much the contamination as just how many tonnes of glass are you getting? How many tonnes of the mixed recyclables? How many tonnes of garbage? What's the split between them? You can put load cells or whatever in the arms as you pick the bins up and you can see what's going on. Yeah. And that way you can say to a, a multi-unit development, this is the change that's happened. This is what's happening at your place. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So um, that is a very good point. And we are looking into a lot of that um, can be supported by better bin technology. Um, so yeah, like cameras on the bins and weights on the bins. And that's something yeah. I think we're looking into and maybe doing a trial with a couple of multi developments. I'm not sure where that's at, but that is how my understanding of how that sort of data is recorded on site. Mm. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, Andy, 
had just had another brief question just in relation to the recycling depot in Clifton Hill. Andy, did you want to ask? Just oh, yeah, ask that sure. Question? sure. I was just wondering whether it had opened up again. I know it closed through the COVID period. Mm. Yeah, um, it hasn't opened up yet, um, but I, we're waiting for advice, I'm pretty sure, from DHHS about that. I haven't heard anything the last few days, uh, but as soon as we get that, we're, like all, all transfer stations and depots have been closed, as soon as we get the green light from the government, uh, we'll put out some communications across uh, Yarra's channels about it being open again. Thanks. Perfect. Well, I think that's um, I think that about wraps up proceedings this evening. Um, so, Sophie, thank you so much for a really informative talk. I think there's you know lots for everyone to to think about, and I'm sure that we all took something practical away and something that we can spread. And you know, the message that you've you know uh, delivered tonight is something we can spread through our own networks so that everyone hopefully can get up to speed as quickly as possible on this really. Um, on this really important issue. So, um, and if anyone missed anything, because it was quite it was quite fact dense. So, if anyone missed anything and thinks they might uh, benefit from a from a rewatch of what happened tonight, um, we will have the we'll have this presentation up on YCAN's website and YouTube channel uh, within the next few days. Um, and that's also the place, of course, that you catch up with all of um, the previous webinars in this series. So. Um, yeah, please, uh, please reference again it's the our web, it's the web, YCAN website and uh, the YCAN YouTube channel. Um, and I sh so, just before we wrap up, just uh, a, a quick plug for the YCAN's final webinar uh, for 2020, which will be held on Wednesday, the 18th of November. Our guest speaker will be Pete Mercurio from the Yarra Energy Foundation. Um, the Air Energy Foundation does awesome work in helping households in Yarra and beyond to reduce their energy consumption and to transition away from fossil fuel based energy sources. Um, we know we're really delighted to have Pete talk to us and to give us some uh, update on um, the, the Yarra Energy Foundation's current initi initiatives. So um, I hope you can join us uh, for that webinar coming up in a month's time. Um, and with that, I'll close the evening. Thank you so much again, Sophie, for, for an excellent time. And thank you for everyone for giving time out on, a, on, a, on your Wednesday evening. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all um, very soon. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone.